आर्काइव्स ऑफ प्रसार भारती प्रेजेंट्स द टाइमलेस ट्रेजर ऑफ गोल्डन एरा Good evening and welcome to Living on the Edge. One of the major fallouts of pollution is the impact it has on our health and the well-being of future generations. This week we examine the ill effects of a practice all of us are acquainted with, many of us indulge in and only a few of us really understand. We also visit the Marine National Park in Gujarat to see how industries are threatening marine life and ask if they can be stopped. And we examine the feasibility of agricultural waste as an alternate fuel. The winter session of parliament may see the passing of a controversial bill that seeks to reduce the use of a product that has been associated with the spirit of freedom. It's used by over 200 million people in India, supports over 6 million laborers and contributes significantly to government revenue. But to all the benefits really add up. Manira Alva reports. I used to smoke two and a half packet now I am taking about 10 cigarettes a day. In 1987, I got a mild heart attack. The cigarette smoking has caused my heart attack, and I am feeling it too much. I tried, but I could not. I have, uh, though I have reduced. The worst possible addiction by a man is smoking, but I could not leave it. Hari Kishan's addiction is shared by 20 million Indian smokers. The number of tobacco users who smoke BDs and chew tambaku is far higher and estimated at 180 million. And tobacco-related ailments claim 3 million lives each year, and over half of these deaths occur in the developing world. Cancers, particularly of the lungs, which are very clearly related to smoking, and apart from cancers, heart attacks. because of diseases of the blood vessels which supply blood to the heart diseases of blood vessels which supply blood to all other parts of the body including those which supply blood to the limbs and blockages of which can lead to gangrene and amputation what is it about tobacco that gets the smoker hooked while some speak of the relaxation and calm that accompanies smoking others equate it with style and character but whatever the reason it is apparent that a one drag fad gradually becomes a habit and eventually turns into an addiction an addiction so strong that statutory warnings and health hazards are hardly ever a consideration no ji kabhi dimag mein ye nahi aaya ke bas dimag mein kabhi nahi aaya ke bhai health kharab hogi ke nahi hogi to cigarette peena chappi tab pita rehta tha well i don't think that uh, a person who smokes he ever looks at the, at the warning the choice or consumption of tobacco is a conscious adult choice the industry does not aim any promotions or advertising at those who are not adults if that were entirely true few people would be smoking as early as the seventh standard besides how does mr amit sarkar explain advertising campaigns that indirectly target teenagers and college going students Moreover, does adult choice preclude the right of the non-smokers to be protected from the hazards of passive smoking? This smoke which emanates from the burning end of the cigarette is often much more concentrated in terms of the toxic substances and doesn't have the benefit of the filter as well. And this can result in a higher risk of cancers, higher risk of heart attacks and several other disorders and particularly of lung problems. It, at times it does affect us you know and you feel like nausea that feeling of nausea is there at times and all and it's a bad smell ultimately it it affects us it was to protect passive smokers and introduce tobacco discipline that the union government declared its offices and public sector buildings smoke free in the 1980s the smoking of cigarette 
um, or BDs, if it has not totally disappeared, it has very drastically declined as a result of administrative instructions. To test the veracity of the Health Secretary's assertion, Living on the Edge visited over a dozen central government offices. Here's what our camera revealed. क्यों बारे में क्या बता रहे हैं बस में भी पीते हैं ड्राइवर पीते हैं कनेक्टर पीते हैं कौन सुने किसकी आजकल कोई किसी नहीं सुनता भाई भाई की नहीं सुनता तो क्या करेगा वो In these circumstances the success of the proposed anti tobacco bill is seriously in question The health ministry is seeking to ban the advertising of all tobacco products further restrict public smoking and introduce a nicotine and tar ceiling in cigarettes and BDs studies which have pointed out that in some of the countries the contribution of ban on advertisement to decline in consumption of cigarettes ranges from 6% to 11%. Not surprisingly, the Tobacco Institute of India which is funded by leading cigarette manufacturers like ITC and GPI is all set to fight the ban. We believe that advertising and international studies have proved this point does not either initiate consumption. In other words, it does not persuade juveniles to start smoking. We are not fighting. We are only putting the, our perspective out to the government to make some sense to their mind whether it is required or not required. After all, we are in business. If money is the bottom line, then tobacco is India's most lucrative cash crop. We are the third largest producers and stand eighth on the list of exporters. Tobacco contributed 2,700 crore rupees to the National Exchequer in 1994 and earned India nearly 500 crores in foreign exchange. Besides, the tobacco industry employs over 6 million citizens, including farmers, which makes it a formidable pressure group. Now this segment, as I told you, accounts for only 20% of domestic consumption. But this 20% provides 90% of the revenues to the government. Similarly, it accounts for 90% of the exports of leaf and manufactured tobacco products. That is a very fallacious uh, kind of reasoning because the resources in the society remain the same. So when you save something from one item, naturally you tend to spend it on another item. So the society as a whole benefits, it uh, does not lose. And in fact, in terms of health benefits, uh, the results are uh, very good. As the wheels of liberalization gain momentum, the likelihood of international brands like Marlboro and State Express staging an entry into India is a definite possibility. More significantly, multinationals faced with declining markets in the West are turning to third world countries to dump their surplus stocks. Just how successful foreign brands will be is uncertain. But increased consumption will push up health care costs in the long term, even if the government does garner additional revenue through taxes. Uh, to counter the adverse effects of tobacco becomes many, many times more than the revenues that are generated by tobacco. The loss of productive person years because of the disability and death because of various deadly disorders of uh, tobacco. Uh, for example, on um, growing tobacco, the land as well, could be diverted for more uh, food crops, uh, better uh, other forms of agriculture. This is borne out by estimates that by 2020 AD, there will be 10 million deaths induced by tobacco, of which 7 million will occur in developing countries. And yet, cigarette companies in India spend absolutely nothing on research to see how risks to the smoker can be reduced. Does the tobacco industry in India invest any money into research as to whether cigarettes are carcinogenic or not? Well, why should we? Because we are not seeing any impact of it. Will you agree with the fact that nicotine is addictive at least? I have no, I have no idea. I do not know. You we do have not, not done know. any study about it, whether it is addictive or not addictive. You have not studied the scientific qualities of a substance that you are selling to the people? No, I have not studied. We have not studied. If that is what one of the leading lights of the cigarette industry believes, here is what independent medical studies reveal about the substances present in a supposedly harmless cigarette. And yet, 
studies such as this are rejected outright by tobacco companies. They prefer spending crores of rupees on high-profile advertising rather than investing in research to reduce the risks of smoking. While ITC is the official sponsor of the Indian cricket team and recently shelled out 40 crores to bag the sponsorship rights of the 1996 World Cricket Cup, GPI sponsors the annual Bravery Awards. The irony of cigarettes, which are proven to be detrimental to health and stamina, supporting events which push individuals to the limits of physical endeavour, seems unimportant to the sponsor. Well, we are, we are doing this, uh, we are doing whatever little responsible corporate citizens, if we can contribute something to the social development, to the needs, uh, other uh, social needs of the society, while simultaneously benefiting ourselves towards our commercial objectives. It is apparent that companies aren't going to watch their profits go up in smoke by highlighting the ill effects of tobacco leave alone reduce its addictive qualities. In the long term, it is only individual restraint and the assertion of the rights of non-smokers to a clean environment that will limit the dangers of smoking and check the spread of an addiction, which though seemingly glamorous, leaves smokers breathless in anticipation of a host of gradually developing health problems. Addiction can take many forms and sizes, and addiction to profit at the cost of an entire ecosystem is perhaps the most reprehensible. When Priya Somaya visited the Marine National Park in Gujarat, she was shocked to find that unchecked leaks and spills from several industries were destroying a conservation effort that goes back a couple of decades. Stretching across 200 kilometers off the Jamnagar coast in Gujarat, is one of India's largest marine parks. A boat ride to Pirotan, one of the islands in the area, reveals a spectacular view of the open sea. The park itself consists of 42 islands ringed by coral reefs and mangrove forests that support over 800 species of marine life and a huge bird population. It is only when the tide recedes that a whole new world is revealed, the dynamic yet fragile world of the coral reef, parts of which are nearly a hundred thousand years old. At first it is difficult to see anything in the shallow muddy waters, but a careful look reveals scores of small creatures algae, sea anemones and mollusks, easily disturbed by human intrusion. This puffer fish, for example, sensing our presence, first tried to skirt away and then, true to its name, puffed up with water and air to reveal spiky bristles and appear larger and more frightening to an attacker. The octopus, on the other hand, squirted black ink and then by camouflaging itself against patterned rocks and corals escaped to safety. These defense mechanisms have evolved over thousands of years to protect these creatures from predators and allow them to survive and breed. The fact that they've survived major climatic changes and evolutionary purges is testimony to their effective adaptation to their environment. But all of a sudden, the exciting world of these fascinating creatures is under threat. In fact, they face complete destruction because their adaptability does not extend to the depredations of man. Today, industrial pollution from chemical industries and power plants along the coast is threatening to destroy the park. But it is only part of a slow, insidious process 
that began when Digvijay Cement, a private company, was allowed to mine and dredge the reef to extract limestone. Huge expanses of the reef were devastated as a result and left devoid of life. Although mining is now banned, poisoning of the reef by chemical and thermal industries continues. Take this thermal power plant for example. It lets out untreated waste consisting of fly ash and chemicals directly into the sea. Add to that GSFC's fertilizer plant, the Tata chemical unit, IOC's oil storage plant and 21 salt works and you have a disaster already in the making. Worse, the Gujarat government has cleared more factories and refineries in the area. I don't know how you would assess risk, but when you have that many pipelines going underground, a single oil slick or an, or an oil leak could, cons uh, could really damage the environment. So you're really looking at a possibility of a catastrophe in that sense, when you have large amounts of oil being uh, you know, uh, transported through that region. This makes the threat of an oil spill a distinct possibility. Worldwide data on tanker spills indicates that for every million tons transported, at least 12 tons are spilled within 80 kilometers of the coast. Already there are allegations that IOC tankers unloading in the area pump small amounts of crude oil into the sea during cleanup operations. We have noticed oil spill here and there. We have uh, seen the damage of uh, mangrove salts on Pirotan many times. Mr. Singh's observations were corroborated by living on the edge. These pictures clearly indicate the reef areas covered by oil sludge. Not only does oil smother the corals, burn mangroves, but it also destroys the delicate balance that nurtures marine life. To begin with, coral reefs and tidal forests are a haven for local and migratory birds. Scores of storks, flamingos, cormorants and egrets roost and breed here by feeding on small protein-rich organisms left behind by the tide. Mangroves, on the other hand, trap oxygen and fresh water in their roots and help sustain whole populations of crabs, small fish and insects. And yet, mangroves have shrunk considerably from an estimated 13 square kilometers in 1973 to less than a third of that today. When I was in the service unit, about 1966, the mangrove was very good. बहुत ही अच्छा था मतलब क्या आदमी जा नहीं पाएगा अंदर जो काल पड़ते हैं बारिश जब कम पड़ती है तो यहाँ के जो किनारे वाले आदमी हैं मिस मतलब केटल वाले जो वो यहाँ का जो मेंगरो का पत्ते हैं वो काट के खिलाते हैं अपने केटलों को तो उसके हिसाब से उसमें जो राइजोफरा नाम का जो पिसिस है वो बिल्कुल डेर but what people don't realize is that destruction of mangroves will have disastrous consequences for man. Already, local fishermen are reporting a reduced catch. Besides, tidal forests are instrumental in checking salinity and preventing coastal winds from eroding the shoreline. That is why conservationists feel that new industries must be set up only after environmental safeguards are met. Once these areas are taken up by industry, it becomes somewhat private to an extent and you really can't go in there and you know, monitor the, the impact that uh, is taking place. You really don't know how far they are you know, uh, treating effluents. You really don't know who is responsible because you have water which is a fairly continuous medium. So you really don't know who the offenders are to that extent. And what they are doing could end up virtually exterminating not only tiny marine life, but also larger mammals and fish. If you're wondering what species are under threat, take a look at this. Already, many of these species are beginning to gradually disappear. And if pollution continues, their disappearance can only become systematic elimination. Even these young herons nestling here will find it impossible to survive, and an ecosystem that has sustained a varied plant and animal life for thousands of years will quite simply fade away.
Agricultural waste is produced in millions of tons each year and constitutes a major disposal problem. Sunil Manoran was happy to find that crop residue is actually a cheap and effective fuel. For every non-renewable source of energy like coal, there exist several non-depleting alternatives that are cheaper and less polluting. Take agricultural waste for instance. Each year, millions of tons of rice and coffee husk, mustard pots and not to mention diverse crop residue are left to rot in the fields. Agricultural waste constitutes a major disposal problem that defies all solutions. Nikhil Pai, for instance, has travelled to Faridabad from Mangalore in Karnataka to find a way to utilize 7,000 tons of coffee husk generated on his estate. Basically, we make coffee beans out of coffee berries and as a byproduct we get this coffee husk. And we presently, there is not much, much use of it in the sense that it is sold as such for, uh, as fuel. But then we thought briquetting will add value to it. The problem is not just limited to coffee producing areas. Waste disposal is becoming more difficult as production techniques improve. But for all those who have access to large quantities of crop residue, here's a unit that turns rice husk, which costs about 500 rupees per ton, into briquettes. The small scale unit preheats the rice husk, which is then fed into the machine. The end product is a cylindrical shaped briquette, which burns as efficiently as coal and costs 1600 rupees per ton. Briquettes are a cheaper option. I think these briquettes have got comparable chlorific value with coal. They are more compact than coal and they being uniform in size give you much better combustion than you can get even with coal. Coal, on the other hand, is a non-renewable source of energy and takes millions of years to form. Moreover, over-exploitation has led to the depletion of coal reserves. Besides, the burning of coal generates a lot of carbon dioxide and leaves behind a lot of fly ash. Considering these, briquettes made out of biomass seem to be a viable option, particularly in areas where large quantities of agricultural waste are generated. We have been thinking of how to make the best use of this husk earlier also. And we knew there was some briquetting uh, systems coming around, but then we were not convinced of those machines which were uh, available. Now, the, these, uh, the present machines which you have seen, are supposed to be, um, uh, you know, the best. But even if the machine is the best, the prohibitive cost may prove to be a hindrance. A whole unit can cost up to 15 lakh rupees. Once the technology is indigenized, however, the cost could drop to around 5 lakhs. But even now, the cost can be recovered in one and a half to two years. And if you take environment protection into account, briquettes are an enduring option, as they are non-polluting with a low ash content and a high calorific value. Briquettes can even be used in brick kilns, boilers and for gasification. So, if you are prepared to delay profit making until you make up the initial cost for an efficient, renewable source of energy with an unending source of raw material, here's whom you can write to. For every eight persons who die of smoking, one is a passive non-smoker.